Thank you for coming, especially on kind of a cold night. Uh, tonight we're very pleased to bring you a gentleman who is an entertainment historian. He has co-authored five historical books with Arcadia Publishing. He has extensive experience in marketing and promotions, and he is currently the marketing manager for the Michigan Opera Theater and the Detroit Opera House. And he's very enthusiastic about Detroit's majestic theaters. Please welcome Michael Hauser. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. It's great to see a, a, a nice crowd. Um, I'm always curious, how many of you worked in theaters? Anybody? Yeah. Which theater? <laughs> the Fox? Orchestra Hall? Okay. Anybody else work in a movie house? The Hills Theater in downtown Rochester. The Hills in downtown Rochester? <laughs> Go ahead, sir. The Fabulous Fox. Okay. Go ahead, Matt. The Fisher? Okay. Great. Great. Well, you know, our first district was on Monroe Street between Woodward and Randolph. And there were about a dozen theaters on that block. And that's, that block has a lot of history to it because that's where the, the, on that block, the first symphonic sounds, the first operas, the first vaudeville, the first movies were actually unspooled and when, back when movies were a single reel uh, at the original Opera House, which stood on Campus Marshes, where Copy War headquarters is today. That Opera House actually was co-managed for a number of years by both the Schuberts and the Niederlanders, which, interestingly enough, are still the two largest presenters of Broadway in North America. They both had a 100-year lease on that theater. That particular theater, though, succumbed to the Depression in 1932 and closed and became our very first discount department store, Sam's. Anybody remember Sam's? And Sam's remained in the Opera House up until the mid-1960s. Now, a lot of these theaters on Monroe Street were converted storefronts. There was even a converted church. And, of course, heating and ventilation and air conditioning really weren't a part of the mix then either. So it was uncomfortable to be in some of these venues. Um, nobody really thought that movies would ever be able to compete with all those other art forms that were around. But the public proved everybody wrong. And those theaters simply weren't large enough to hold the crowds. So the district moved up to Grand Circus Park in the late teens. 1917, 1918, the Adams Theater and the Madison Theater both opened within six months of each other. And those were 1800 seat theaters, sort of built in a neoclassical style of architecture. Then in 1922 came the Capitol Theater, which is today's Opera House. And then by the mid 20s, you had the Oriental Theater, which a lot of people have forgotten about. That was on West Adams. That was a 3,000 seat theater. 1925, 1926, of course, you had the, the Palms. Palm State opened, the Michigan opened. 1928 was a real pivotal year because Detroit was, by 1928, Detroit was literally doubling its population because of the automotive industry. So in 1928, the Fox Theater opened, the Gem and the Century Theaters opened. What is now the Music Hall Theater opened, United Artists Theater opened, the Fisher Theater opened, and of course the building boom. That same year, the Guardian Building opened, the Penobscot Building opened, the Buell Building, Fisher Building. So Detroit was literally going crazy with population and, and building. And we were blessed with some of the largest theaters ever to be constructed in the country, not only just downtown, but neighborhood houses as well. Some of our large neighborhood houses, such as the Ramona on Gratiot, uh, the Redford at Grand River and Lasser, the Riviera on Grand River, these were all 2,000 seat theaters. And you know, there's a gentleman in our audience tonight too, his favorite theater was, of course, the Hollywood. And uh, the Hollywood was on 4th Street, and that was 3,000 seats. And, so, and a lot of this growth came because of our extensive streetcar system that we had running out Woodward, Gratiot, Ford, 
Michigan, Grand River. Um, a lot of these theaters survived, you know, the wars, depression, you name it. Um, and you have to remember back in the day too, I, you wonder how they could afford to produce what they did. Because probably the three biggest venues for movies and stage shows, of course, were the Fox, the Broadway Capitol, and the Michigan, which all had stage shows. Each of those, those theaters had their own orchestra. The Fox, of course, went even further because they had their own ballet corps, their own orchestra, and their own precision dancers, 32 precision dancers called the Tillerettes, which was the Fox's version to the Rockettes at Radio City. And we even, I know both theaters had several dancers who went back and forth across Grand Circus Park who danced at the Fox and danced also in shows at the Broadway Capitol. Now the Broadway Capitol also was known as, as the Poor Man's Symphony too for a number of years because we had the 40-piece Capitol Wonder Orchestra at that theater. So on Sunday afternoons, the price of your ticket, you could see a movie, cartoon, listen to the symphony. Now, up until through the 1950s, we also had Radio Schoolhouse of the Air, which was broadcast live every Sunday afternoon on WXYZ Radio. And that was an American Idol of its day, a talent <coughs> showcase. And last year, when we had Wicked at the theater, we had um, a, a lady called and said, uh, I want to bring my mother down. Well, we've got tickets for Wicked. Uh, my mom actually sang in, during, during those years of Radio Schoolhouse of the Air. I'd like to have her have a tour of the theater, and she will bring some pictures and show you exactly where she, you know, had rehearsal and all that sort of stuff. So it, we, it's always great to talk to people with, with history, and she brought pictures of um, uh, her and her mom coming downtown, getting off the bus on Madison, Madison Street side of the theater. They were East Siders. So, so it's always fun to learn different stories of the theaters. But the, Michigan, of course, had its own orchestra, and most people remember the Michigan for um, a lot of big bands uh, playing at that theater. Um, there was also another sort of little district on Michigan Avenue by the phone company that had several grind houses. These, these are theaters that stayed open 24-7, never closed. There was the Loop Theater and the Times Square Theater. And of course, the National on Monroe Street, too, was open 24-7 for a number of years. And then just north of downtown, you had another secondary district where the Mayfair Theater, which of course today is the Bonstell Theater, the Fine Arts Theater, the Roxy Theater, the Colonial Theater, these were also 24-7 uh, houses. The, the Colonial was... Uh, uh, part of the RKO chain for a number of years, just like the RKO Uptown at Woodward and Six Mile, and also the, what, the, the Oriental, which was also known as the RKO Downtown Theater. So um, a lot of these theaters, of course, were built with studio money, too. You have to remember, for a number of years, the studios had a lot of control of the industry. They produced the movies, they distributed the movies, and they handpicked the theaters that a lot of these films would go into because they owned the theaters. So in the case of the Broadway Capitol, um, that was actually known as the Paramount Theater from 1929 up until 1934, owned by Paramount Pictures. Of course, the Fox Theater was built by William Fox, who founded 20th Century Fox Films. Um, the United Artist, of course, was built with money from United Artist Studio, which, of course, was uh, Douglas Fairbanks, Charlie Chaplin. So, and the Adams Theater for a number of years um, was owned by Balaban and Katz, who owned a number of theaters in Chicago, and they played almost exclusively MGM product. So, we were also one of the few cities to have a building dedicated to the industry. I don't know if you had a chance to look at any of these items up here. Um, the Film Exchange Building on Cass Avenue, directly behind the Fox. This was a seven-story building. Um, this is back in the day when all of the studios had branch offices here in Detroit. So most of the studios were in that building, and then on the seventh floor was a screening room 
which is where the exhibitors, the folks who owned the theaters throughout the state, would come to see, preview the movies, you know, so that they could see what they want to put into their theaters. And that's also the screening room where reviewers for radio and, and newspapers would come see the films as well. Um, now, 20th Century Fox had their own building on Cass, and some of you might remember um, Paramount Pictures built the building where the Michigan Chronicle newspaper is today, right near Masonic Temple. That was Paramount's home. Universal Pictures had their own building um, right behind the Palm State Theater. So, but most of this is all gone. The Film Exchange Building still sits there, although it's vacant. We were also one of the few cities to have a weekly magazine called Weekly Film News. This goes way back to the teens. And um, working with a professor from U of M who's done a lot of research on this, the only city that he has been able to trace that had a magazine like this was in, was in Pittsburgh. So this magazine came out every week. There was obviously news about movies and movie, movie stars, but it also had all sorts of little tidbits about each of the theaters downtown as well. Um, I brought a lot of other things here too. Concessions. Concessions wasn't always a part of the mix of theaters. Now at the old opera house, the only thing they served was Werner's ginger ale. But for many, many years, the mindset was that soda, candy, and popcorn belonged at circuses and carnivals, and not at movie houses, and certainly not at legitimate stage theaters. So it wasn't until the early 1940s where you started to see candy. Machines in the backs of lobbies, ushers hawking candy up and down the aisles. Mid-1940s, popcorn introduced. Well, people were sneaking it in anyway, because there was always a confectionery store, or today we call it a party store, on the same block as theaters. People sneaking it in. Then management finally got smart and started to salt the popcorn. Well, we all know what happens then. There's quench. So by 1950, Coca-Cola was in virtually every movie house and legitimate stage theater that had concessions. So it took almost a decade for this to unravel itself. And of course, as we all know today, whether you're a movie house or a stage theater, you cannot live without that revenue. And particularly for movie houses, it has never really changed. If you get a brand new picture that's going to have legs, meaning it's going to be around for 8 to 12 weeks, say like the new Star Wars picture that recently came out, in a multiplex today, you're going to put that picture in the largest auditorium, which would be your six or 700 seat theater. Then, after business wanes, after four or five weeks, it's going to go into the 300-seater. Then, six or seven weeks in, it'll go into the 150-seater. Well, for those first six weeks, in many cases, the contract states that 90% of what the exhibitor, the theater owner, takes in has to go back to the studio. So you're only keeping 10%. Well, you've got to pay a staff, you've got heat, air, lights, security, so that's why we pay what we do, in many cases, particularly with uh, movie houses, what we do for soda, candy, and popcorn, and why they're always trying to get you to buy the combo meal. <laughs> Even though most people are pretty hard pressed to eat a giant drum of popcorn <laughs> or a pop like this, because otherwise you're gonna be spending most of your time in the restroom rather than watching the movie. <laughs> So and it, it, it's crazy that that has never changed. But by the time you get into like the sixth week, you can get that sliding scale down. So between six and eight weeks, you, if you get that down to 30%, you're doing pretty darn good. And then you get to keep 70% and only 30% is going back to the studio. So we are also pretty lucky in the Detroit market. We still have some value cinemas. Most markets, this is totally gone away. But the Penn Theater in Plymouth, which of course was a grassroots movement to save that theater, uh, the Civic Theater in downtown Farmington, which is owned by the city, um, Movie 16 in Warren at the old Universal Mall. Mm -hmm. but unfortunately, we recently, this past fall, lost the multiplex at uh, uh, Macomb Mall. Mm -hmm. But uh, with 
everything that's going on there, they want to go more upscale, build a new multiplex. Um, and then also the Allen Theater downriver in Allen Park. Uh, is also um, a dollar fifty house, which is actually part of the MJR chain. And we are also very lucky that we still have some independent movie chains that are actually based in our area, because in so many cities around the country, all they have are the AMCs of the world, you know, major conglomerates. And here we have MJR, which is based here locally, Imagine Theaters, which is based in the Metro Detroit area and also Phoenix Theaters, uh, which you'll see Corey in uh, a video coming up here in a few minutes. So, uh, so in those respects, we're pretty, pretty, pretty uh, lucky. Um, there are a lot of things with movie houses that have completely gone away. Um, a lot of these theaters, particularly the big downtown theaters, would have a full-time person on staff to do nothing but create huge posters and hand-painted signage that would be under the marquees. And then also, for a number of years, too, banners that hung under the marquee, like this Technicolor one and Cinemascope one. Um, gimmicks were also popular for a lot of movies and movie houses through the years. Cinerama was very, very smart. Um, everybody who came to Cinerama got a color postcard that you could fill out with your name an address so that they could capture that and let you know when the next Cinerama presentation was going to come out. Sort of like what we do today with, you know, if you're in marketing trying to capture emails. So, um, and uh, you also got a commemorative booklet when you went to see a, a Cinerama a production. And a lot of movies, big movies too, uh, roadshow type movies like Hawaii and Sound of Music. Um, I've got some of those booklets displayed on the piano over there. Roadshow movies particularly were popular in the 60s. Um, things like Sound of Music, you know, which played the Madison Theater for two years. These were movies, sort of like stage shows, where you'd buy your ticket in advance and you had an assigned seat. Um, Cinerama really paved the way for widescreen <laughs> movies. Uh, Studios became very jealous of Cinerama. Cinerama came about because of television. Once television came in in the early 50s, movie going just really went down. And studios were very worried. Um, Cinerama pictures, for the most part, were travelogues. But they also became the highest grossing films of the year. Um, 20th Century Fox, in particular, was very... Uh, ticked about the success of this. And so they ended up coming out with CinemaScope. Paramount ended up coming out with VistaVision. And pretty soon, every single studio had their own version of a vision in order to get you, the moviegoer, to come back to theaters. So uh, Cinerama lasted up until about 1967 or so. How the West was the one was the last major film produced uh, in that format. Uh, but it also paved the way for IMAX, too, which we enjoy today. Um, I'm going to show you three short videos. The first one is um, an exhibit that I did at the Detroit Historical Museum a couple of years ago. Um, and then the second one is going to be a short video on the recent 50th anniversary of the Fisher Theater uh, as a Broadway house. Uh, some of you probably remember that the Fisher... <coughs> flourished as a movie house from 1928 up through 1959. It was built in a uh, Mayan Aztec style of architecture. There's a couple of images over here. Uh, but then in 1960, when it reopened as a Broadway house, it was completely renovated. I guess today we'd probably call it a version of an international style of architecture. Uh, but the Fisher flip-flop back and forth through the years when it was a movie palace. Uh, most of the time it played second-run pictures and double features that were move-over films from the Broadway Capitol downtown. And they also shared the, the stage shows. Once the Broadway Capitol got done with the stage show, it would move on over to the Fisher. So amazing that they would spend millions to build this theater uh, to show primarily second-run films and move over pictures from other theaters. So um, why don't we go ahead? I want to see if I can get this to work properly. <clears throat> Historical Society presents
presents Detroit, the real story. Detroit has always been at the forefront of film exhibition. From the early screenings of the first moving pictures at the former Detroit Opera House on Campus Marshes, to the Casino Theater on Monroe Street, one of North America's earliest venues devoted to exclusively exhibiting films, Detroiters have long enjoyed great movies and great venues in which to view them. Without exaggeration, there must have been 50, 60 neighborhood theaters in Detroit. You pay one price, you can stay all day. From 12 o'clock noon to 12 o'clock midnight. But the theater was worth the price of admission alone. Theaters in downtown Detroit were initially concentrated along Monroe Street near Campus Marshes and after 1919 were clustered around Grand Circus Park. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, Detroit's residents enjoyed viewing films at majestic downtown movie palaces, many of which were crafted by renowned architects. For those who lived far from downtown, the expansion of streetcar and later motor coach lines out Woodward, Gratiot, Michigan, and Grand River Avenues paved the way for the growth of many neighborhood and early suburban theaters. As these cities around the country were spreading out, then these perimeter areas, some of them became prime spots for deluxe theaters. Witness of the Fisher, the RKO uptown, the Cinderella on the east side. The theaters were divided up. There were neighborhood theaters, downtown theaters, and driving theaters. The downtown theaters were sort of just <coughs> hunting tents in those days. It was a place to really go out, and one felt that you had to be dressed properly for the downtown theaters. And they only showed first run. The neighborhood theaters would receive movies after they left downtown, and that's where we would go in groups. As a child, it was every Saturday. All the kids from the neighborhood would go en masse to the Eastside Theater, later the Rialto. Economic and demographic changes of the 1950s and 1960s dramatically altered film exhibition in Detroit, as well as the movie-going experience. Following World War II, residents began leaving the city for homes in emerging suburban cities. By the mid-1950s, Detroit's once viable streetcar and interurban train systems were no more, as individuals relied on personal transportation to transport them to work and to their leisure time activities. During the second half of the 20th century, the movie-going experience changed significantly, as theater owners utilized gimmicks and new technology to move patrons away from their televisions. The dish giveaway was probably the biggest gimmick that I, that I can remember. I'm sure there were others, that was a big one. On dish night, everybody <coughs> came with me, a dish really very tight. If, some, if one of the women would drop the dish, of course it would land on the floor with a big crash, everybody would clap. <laughs> oh, and so if I happened to go on dish night, I didn't take a dish. Well, that was practically sacrilegious. If you were a lady, you took a dick, but I never did. In Detroit, fewer people ventured downtown for a movie, and suburban cinemas sprang up throughout the region. Downtown movie palaces either closed or were forced into showing genre films, including kung fu, horror, and slasher films. By the 1980s and 1990s, efforts to preserve and restore Detroit's movie palaces were well underway with the reopening of the Fox Theater and efforts to restore the Redford Theater. Many neighborhood cinemas were closed as patrons increasingly visited multiplexes operated by large theater chains. Detroit, the real story, showcases the rich history of Detroit's vast network of theaters, large and small, chains and independents, ethnic and specialty venues, and little-known cinemas from the early part of the 20th century to <coughs> today's multiplexes. The exhibit also explores some of the extras, from popcorn to 3D glasses, that made the movie-going experience so memorable for millions of patrons. You have that experience that's outside the home, and it's a communal experience, and the film takes on a very, very different quality. And I think there has to be a difference in our industry between what is film and what is television. 
And, and I think that, that certainly something will be lost if these things go away. And I think that we have a chance to go back to something again that people were really enjoying and, and, and make it new and fresh and better. Uh, and also, uh, you know, bring back some memories of some people and create a new experience for, for another generation of people. <laughs> the Detroit Historical Society presents Detroit, the real story. Enjoy the show. Well, Bill and Crystal Clark, who you saw in the video, unfortunately we lost Bill a few years ago. Uh, Crystal is still with us. Those two met at the old Chandler Theater on Harper Avenue, 1943. And uh, Bill was manager of the theater and Crystal ran the candy counter. They fell in love, got married. They loved the business so much, they started their own theater service, Clark Theater Service, which through the years booked probably just about every indoor theater and almost all of our drive-in theaters throughout Michigan and also some of the theaters in Indiana and Ohio. And of course their office initially was in the old Film Exchange building and then later on they moved into the, the Fox Theater building. So Crystal is still, she keeps track of the grosses every day. You can ask her what played 50 years ago, what movie, where it played, what it grossed. Um, incredible memory and still loves the movies and still gets invitations to go to all of the screenings. Um, I'm going to show you another real quick clip here, too. This was produced for the 50th anniversary of the Fisher Theater recently as a Broadway house. Detroit remains the fans. Thank you for bringing 
bringing us to this golden milestone as we look ahead to another 50 years of fabulous and memorable performances. Going has changed a lot, as have the locations of the theaters. As Lamar pointed out, well, he said 50 or 60 theaters. Of course, if you look at the movie guides from the 1930s, as they progressed up to the 1980s, we had actually a hundred locations just within the city limits of Detroit of where one could go see a film, both downtown and neighborhood houses. Uh, today, in terms of first-run films, it's basically uh, the Bel Air Complex at 8 Mile and Van Dyke. Uh, the Renaissance Theaters recently closed this past fall. Um, if you're an East Sider, <laughs> like myself, there is nothing first run from Renaissance all the way up to 15 Mile, Star Gratiot, uh, or out to 23 Mile or 26 to see a movie, which is really, really too bad. I mean, the Art Institute does Art and Independent, the Redford does Classic, but... Uh, it's, they talk about food deserts. Well, we've got theater deserts in terms of movies <laughs> in our town. Um, World War II, there's some images over on both sides here too. World War II, of course, was very important too uh, with all the different uh, war loans. Uh, probably next to Hudson's, uh, the movie theater so sold more war bonds than anybody else in town. And we also were one of the first cities to have a full-time newsreel theater, uh, the Telenews Theater, on Woodward just south of Grand Circus Park. And newsreel theaters, you gotta remember there was no television then. So this is where you went to see loved ones on the big screen. And of course the minute you walked in off of Woodward there was a teletype machine in the lobby so you could get the latest news. If you didn't want to go upstairs and watch the newsreels, you could go downstairs into the lower level. Uh, WJLB broadcast live from the lower level. And then there was also a reading room where you could read the latest copies of the Detroit Free Press, the Detroit Times, the Detroit News. That newsreel theater was so popular that the old Norwood Theater at Woodward and the Boulevard was transformed into our second telenews theater. Now the building is actually still there. It's actually um, a Payless shoe source today. <laughs> and I, I, oh, I forgot to bring it. Anyways, I got a little booklet here from the Fox Theater of when you would sign up when you purchased your war bonds. Um, 3D glasses. I've got these are actual samples over here from the Fox Theater. I bought a double was the first major 3D picture, although most people probably remember House of Wax as being the most famous of all the 3D pictures. And again, this was another gimmick to get people to come back to the movies. Back then, that's just a sampling. There, I think there were like 15 different colors of 3D glasses you could select for whatever you wanted to wear while you were watching that picture. Um, and you didn't have to turn them back in to be washed or pay uh, an additional fee. Um, this next clip is going to be, I'm going to show you a preview. Uh, this was a documentary done several years ago about Cinerama. Two young guys in Los Angeles discovered a warehouse in LA that contained rows and rows and rows and rows of film of all these Cinerama films that were just sort of withering away. Cinerama actually is owned by um, Pacific Theaters in LA, and they got permission to start digitizing all of these films. And then they also did this 90 minute documentary that I'm gonna show you a clip from. Cinerama, actually, I'll pass these around. These are some of the more recent ones that have been digitized. Many of 
us experience childhood memories that on occasion rush into our consciousness. A memory that pervaded my mind on numerous occasions was when I was only six years old, and my parents took me and my sister on a special trip to St. Louis, Missouri. On the last day of this visit, we arrived at a very large, ornate old movie theater. It was as if we'd walked into a soul's palace out of the Arabian Nights. It was the Ambassador Theater, and it was specially set up for a new kind of motion picture event. Here, we were to be treated to an unusual giant screen movie that would lift us out of our seats and take us on a trip all over the world. I am not alone with this memory, for there were millions of children all through the 1950s and early 60s whose parents took them to one of those special theaters to see and marvel at these amazing travel adventures. Through the years, I've always wondered whatever happened to this old film process, how it started, and how it finally faded away, and why it had had such an impact on me and others. So I decided to find out, and this documentary represents what I found. It is told mostly through the words of the people who were there, the engineers who developed it, the crew members who traveled the world filming with it, the performers, and the exhibitors. People who are to this day still very passionate about its uniqueness. It's an American story, and it is their Cinerama adventure. Oh, that'll give you just a little preview. 
Uh, it's a 90 minute documentary. It's really well done. If you love film, you'll really enjoy this. And I think if you still purchase How the West Was Won, you get this as a bonus. <laughs> I'm going to stir your memory now with a couple of images that I'm going to pass around. Um, in 1939, Walt Disney released Fantasia, and the music hall was one of only a handful of theaters in the country selected to premiere Fantasia, and they actually had to close the theater for a week so they could install all of these special RCA speakers. So it was really early surround sound. Some of you might remember the Family Theater on Cadillac Square. Now, this was sort of an anomaly. Yes, at one time it did show G and PG rated films, but by the 1960s it was, shall we say, art films. <laughs> but they never changed the name of the theater. Okay, it was uh, West Siders of the Redford, of course, which is still with us, still showing classic pictures. This is a stage show at the Riviera, which was uh, at Grand River and Joy. That theater was so successful when it opened, it, they couldn't contain the crowds. There were so many people, they actually built a second theater right across Joy Road on the same side of the street, the Riviera Annex Theater. The Arkeo Uptown at Woodward and Six Mile, the facade is still there, but the auditorium was demolished. The Beverly was another really cool Art Madere Theater on Grand River near Oakman. Or the West Town on Wyoming for you West Siders. And I know some folks love this theater, the Hollywood, which was an absolute beautiful, beautiful theater. Where was that? Where was that? West Fort Street at Ferdinand. Now, you know, it was built this is in southwest Detroit. Because, you know, the city fathers felt that the city, you know, back at that time was actually going to move in a southwestward direction. You already had Michigan Central Station, you know, on Michigan Avenue there. Uh, there was a lot of commerce on Fourth Street and Burner. But instead, of course, the metro area went in a northwestward direction. And so by the late 1950s, <laughs> this theater was hemorrhaging cash big time and closed and was demolished. Uh, this is the marquee at the, at the Hollywood. Um, interestingly, there's an exhibit at the library here of signage, and I actually saw uh, a photograph out here in your exhibit in your library here of a gentleman working on this very vertical sign at the Vogue Theater, which is, was at uh, Cashew and Harper. It's a McDonald's today. <laughs> Uh, the Harper Theater, also on Harper, near Chalmers. Um, still a nightclub today. It's for sale. You can have it for $400,000 if you want it. Did you think about it, Michael? <laughs> Another fantastic neighborhood house, 2,000 plus seats, East Town, Harper, and Van Dyke. Sad story, actually demolished. What about a month or so ago? Um, this theater flourished as a large neighborhood house right up into the 70s and then became a concert theater. And then, like so many you know, buildings in the city, um, succumbed to all different sorts of things. Um, raves, then it was a church, uh, methadone clinic on the main floor. Uh, this is the Ramona at Gratiot at Six Mile, another 2,000 seat house. East Siders might remember the Cinderella on East Jefferson at the Bend. This was another United Detroit theater. United Detroit was our powerhouse chain. They operated most of the big downtown theaters uh, and also some of the early neighborhood and suburban theaters like the Royal Oak and the Birmingham, the Redford, Ramona. And here's the Royal Oak which still has this fantastic marquee that just brings 4th Street to life whenever there's a show. Birmingham, it's interesting when the Illiches 
uh, renovated the Birmingham. Of course, they tried to replicate, you know, the marquee and the vertical, of course. Ordinances, what they are in Birmingham, they couldn't have chaser lights <laughs> after they renovated it. And of course, now this theater reads, you know, it's interesting too, movies, and then of course the Nederlanders were here in the 70s into the 80s doing off-Broadway type shows. Then it reverted back to movies with the Illiches who renovated it, turned it into an eightplex. Um, they sold it a few months ago. It's actually operated by um, John Yeah, out of California, right? Yeah, Bloomfield. Oh, the Palladium. Yeah, the Palladium. The but the original Birmingham is, uh, cent uh, I think it's Centurion out of California, is putting money into that. <laughs> Okay, now, um, we also have a local advertising agency. It's called Real Integrated today. It used to be called Solomon Friedman Advertising. Uh, founded by these two gentlemen, Robert Solomon on the right here, and um, Shan Sales on the left. Now, these two guys were students at Wayne State University, loved movies. 1950, Charlton Heston had a new movie, Julius Caesar. It was a little racy. The commercial theaters didn't want to touch it. So these two guys were able to convince the studio to screen it at the Art Institute Theater, bought their own ads uh, in, the, in the Times, the News, and the Free Press, and it was very successful. As a result of that, they started this ad agency, which is still with us today. This is actually uh, the premiere of Shane at the Michigan Theater. Shane, the guy on, the, on your right here, also was the marketing director for United Detroit Theaters. This is back in the day when all the stars would come to town. He would have to trot them to the radio stations and the newspapers. What a job. He's still with us. He's in, Shane is about 84 today, still owns a chain of movie houses in California. And here he is uh, when they brought Rock, Rock Hudson to town for a film. And here's Charlton Heston at the Michigan. And this is the premiere of War of the Worlds at the Palm State. So we wanted to take a few minutes, if anybody has any questions or anybody wants to share a memory of their favorite theater. Um, I, was, uh, I went, was raised in Detroit, and and one of the shows that you did not mention on the west side was the Senate show. And that was a whole experience in itself because you had the show, then you had Senate Sweet Shop on one side, Senate Coney Island on the other side. <laughs> there, we, there we go. And, and also Better Made Potato Chips was a little store. And so it was like kids heaven, you know, four, four storefronts all, all together. I mean, and you spent the whole afternoon going from one place to the to the other. The other thing is you mentioned about the Hollywood Theater. I remember going with my mother and there was actually a separate section in the back for mothers with little children and it was glassed and closed so if the children were crying or whatever, it didn't disturb anybody else in the theater. So Many theaters have cry rooms. <laughs> and in fact, when the State Wayne Theater was renovated two years ago, they actually, they didn't even know it. There was so much junk upstairs. We cleared out all the junk and it's like, oh my gosh, you got to save this. This is the original cry room with the seats and the glass. And... Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You didn't mention the theater that I recall. Uh, at the age of 21, to celebrate my 21st birthday, I, they took me to Detroit. And of course, after hitting one bar here and there, they thought that we should go to the Gaiety Theater. And I don't know if you recall that or if that ever was in existence or whatever happened to it. But, uh, of course, I thought that was going to, we all went in, you know, we were all pretty well dressed up. And we went in, and here we are in these theater seats, and it was like this bum was over here, and this homeless person was over here. And I didn't know what I expected, but it was quite a burlesque show anyway, so do you know anything about the gay The, the gay scene was on Cadillac <coughs> Square, which was burlesque. Yeah, they never showed movies. No, the National, the National was, it flip-flopped through the years. It opened for vaudeville, 
then went to movies, then went to burlesque, then went to movies. And this, of course, this is back in the day when burlesque meant something a little different than uh, 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 TNA, shall we say. Uh, <laughs> Ace G's and G strings and things like that. Um, and then we also had um, Stone Burlesque, just north of the Fox Theater. There was uh, the Empress Burlesque on the 600 block of Woodward, near where City County Building is today. Uh, so a fair number of, and there was Cadillac Burlesque um, near Michigan Avenue. Uh, you mentioned one of my favorite uh, theaters, Stone Burlesque. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we used to um, go right out of high school. We were underage, and um, they used to let us in, in the show. And, um, in 1966, I was a sophomore in high school, and I went to Stone Burlesque with my buddies, and I remember seeing, and I wonder if you might, or somebody here might know, there was a woman performing, and she was called The Last of the Red Hot Mamas. And I, and I, I looked her up the other day, I can't think of what her name is, it might be Sophie. Sophie, Sophie, Tucker. Like Sophie Tucker. Tucker or something, Sophie is that right? No, is that it? No, okay, well anyway. I think her name is Sophie. Anyway, she, 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 she died yeah, in she did, 66, yeah. but uh, uh, I don't know. It was, it was, a, it was classic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of those types, a lot of what we call exploitation films saved a lot of these big downtown theaters and neighborhood theaters, gave them another life. Because by the 1960s, for so many years, you had to come downtown to see a first-run movie. It would take weeks or months for it to reach a neighborhood house. But by the 1960s, the studios were going where the public was going, and that was to suburban areas. And so the downtown theaters struggled by showing horror, gore, kung fu, and softcore porn. And, but it kept these buildings open. Now, in the case of the Broadway Capitol, which is, which is now the Opera House, we love to talk about this on tours. <laughs> Our theater closed for movies in November of 1978. The theater closed to a whopping crowd of 40 gentlemen in raincoats <laughs> who were there to see The Naked Rider, At Last At Last, and Jill ba Babysitter. Now, these are all socially redeeming films. They're PG by today's standards and they're on DVD. I think the the most starkest comparison of when this switch took over, and almost all the downtown theaters did this, was at the United Artists, which really struggled towards the end. 1970, the last big road show to play there was Goodbye Mr. Chips, G-rated. Nobody came to see that picture. And you gotta remember, you got a 2000 seat theater, even with a pared down staff, back then it was still costing between five and 10 grand just to open the doors. So they closed the theater for a week, got rid of all the expensive, nice furniture and the paintings and all that, and then reopened the next week with the secret sex lives of Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> Anything to keep the doors open. I just had a question. I think the National Theater, that was um, by Alfred Kahn. I think he designed it, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the only theater that we're aware of that Albert Kahn designed, and it's the only surviving building on that original block where those, the first theaters were. It opened in 1911. Um, Dan Gilbert has purchased everything around that theater. It's tied up in some legal maneuverings right now because there are two people who technically own the building but haven't done anything with it. And so hopefully through eminent domain, Gilbert will get it and then he's being greatly pressured by the city to retain the beautiful terracotta facade and also reinstall all those light bulbs that used to be in there because there were hundreds and hundreds of light bulbs that illuminated that theater. Which I always, theater? the National. On Monroe Street. Oh, you can't miss it. It's right across from CompuWare headquarters. Oh, okay. So I always thought it would have been a great project for DTE several years ago when they turned 100 years old. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you, Michael. It's been a great presentation. One thing I wanted to mention to everybody, uh, many of you are probably aware that at one time, various times in downtown Rochester, there were not one but two movie theaters. Um, the Hills and another theater at various times was called the Avon and the Idle Hour. What you may not be aware of is that there is an effort currently underway to return a movie theater, an art house movie theater specifically, back to Main Street in downtown Rochester. Uh, and some of you may have been uh, guests at the uh, Film Society of Rochester's Film Festival last September. Um, there are efforts that are well underway, and if you are interested in learning more about this endeavor and um, supporting it, being on our mailing list, and um, generally being part of this whole initiative to bring a theater back to downtown Rochester, uh, please visit the Facebook page uh, for the Film Society of Rochester and you'll find regular updates about activities for the group and uh, progress reports on the things that are going on. So uh, it's an exciting time and we're, we're optimistic that uh, within the next year or two that we'll be able to have a uh, uh, fully functioning art house movie theater right on Main Street in downtown Rochester. And we certainly encourage anybody of, uh, who's interested in taking part in that effort. So, yes, that's a, at this time, let me, uh, <laughs> no, 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 well, <laughs> the, one, of, one of my colleagues involved in the theater project. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, and you can sign up on the, um, our website um, and get on our email list. And that um, website is filmsocietyofrochester.com or .org. I don't know. Um, what is it? I believe it's .org. Org. So you can um, get on our email list. I'm really sorry. Um, I'm too involved. I don't look at the email list. Um, but you can get on the list and then we will be sending out emails. Um, try, we're going to start trying to do the monthly uh, updating everybody on what's going on. And we hope to have some pop-up movie theater uh, coming soon. It's probably in the springtime. Thank you, Brian. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, I'm wondering about the, uh, there's a theater, you're, you parked the Grand Circus and you're heading toward Hudson's. And we know about two blocks uh, towards uh, Hudson's uh, on Woodward. Do you know, ever remember the name of that theater? It had kind of a modern uh, design out in the, facing the road. I mentioned the telenos, but he doesn't think it was the telenos. I, Armando, I can't remember of another theater no other, theater. other than no. the telenos. It's an Art Deco um, facade. You know, a lot of Michigan connections with the movies through the years, too. Um, American Seating Company in Grand Rapids probably made more seats for more theaters than anybody else throughout the country. Um, also, a lot of people tend to forget, too, Brankert Light Projection made thousands of movie projectors right here in Detroit for movie theaters all around the country. <coughs> a lot of folks um, kept scrapbooks, too. This is just an example of a scrap. A lot of people, would, they would keep their tickets, cut out you know, they, you know, reviews from the newspapers and things like that. Um, a lot, a lot of instances, too, exhibitors would get in trouble with questionable films, which is why we also had the Greater Detroit Motion Picture Council, which had their own rules and regulations. Uh, that was sort of like a group, if you've ever seen Cinema Paradiso, when the Catholic Church had to preview the pictures before they were able to play in the theaters, and the priest would go through there with his scissors and snip, snip, snip. No, you can't show this. <laughs> Where is he when we need him? Anybody else have any memories? <laughs> no, I just got a question about drive-in theaters. Can you talk about drive-in theaters? Um, drive-in theaters, we really don't have many left. Uh, Ford, Wyoming, of course, is one of the biggest ones. Um, <coughs> there is still one in cold water, like a free drive-in, and probably the best known in Michigan, the Cherry Bowl, yeah. up north between Frankfurt and Traverse City. It's in a little town called Honor. And unfortunately, and this has been family owned for years, the owner unfortunately died in a tragic um, storm accident two years ago. 
Um, but when you go into the concession stand there, it's literally a museum. The walls, the ceilings, everything, cinema through the years. Um, very family friendly. I think they're open April to October every year. But it's a great, great place to go, especially if you're going up north. And I think the Getty in Muskegon is still open. I think there's still one in the Flint area that's still open. Uh, but you're down to maybe a couple hundred in the entire country now. So um, drive-ins probably, the zenith of drive-ins was probably mid-50s into the early 60s. I'm sure a lot of you remember going to the drive-in and sneaking in in a trunk or... <laughs> <laughs> never? Never? Hey, anybody else want to share a memory or tell us about your favorite theater? I have a friend's grandmother who talks about the Fisher Theater. Her job there was polishing the brass in that building, the Fisher Theater building. And she said there were a group of ladies, and they would start. And when they would finish all the way around the building, it was time to start all over again. So that was, that was her job. And I know one theater that we didn't talk about today was, uh, was one of my favorite theaters, and I like the story of it, the, the Gem Theater, you know. And for those of you that uh, can remember, you know, about the move, how they moved it, and we, they had a, I've been to a presentation, and they showed, you know, the, how the men designed this to move this building. And uh, I can remember my father talking about this theater. Uh, he didn't get married till uh, late in his life. Uh, so, I, you know, and I asked him one time, oh, you know, what did you do? And, you know, I was a child, and he would say he went to this theater. And he told me one of the names that it was called before, and, oh, what did they show there? <laughs> and he, when the way he explained burlesque, I would have no idea what it was about. <laughs> I think you said something like there were clowns and entertainment, and it was more explaining like a vaudeville. Okay. <laughs> Not quite. But yeah. This I is an image of the gem when it was the cinema theater. Oh, this is Menno uh, premiere in 1950. The gem for many, many years was the place to go see an art and independent film. This was before my time, but I, I hear I hear saying. But one of the more but the burlesque show used to uh, feature a uh, a comedian, and people used to talk about the famous comedian in Detroit. It was either well as at one of the burlesque houses here, uh, was named Scurvy, and, and every 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 guy in town knew who Scurvy was. He was the comedian at the. Uh, at the burlesque show. Oh, maybe that's what he was yeah. trying to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> I remember going downtown to the Adams Theater. Me and my mother, we decided one morning we was just going to leave all the other kids and just sneak out the house, get on the bus, and go downtown and just have a day. It was just six of us. So we got down here, we went down to the Adams Theater, and there was this movie showing it, and I think it must have been about 16. It was called The Omen. Oh, yeah. And then there was another movie, because they showed two, the two movies at the theater, called um, Suspiria. So we just going up in there to watch the movie. We were so scared of those movies. We were in the middle of the aisles, and we said, we leaving. So we had this brilliant, brilliant idea to go downstairs to the bathroom. Got down there, the bathroom reminded me of the movie Suspiria. <laughs> so we ran back upstairs. <laughs> but it was so much fun. Yeah. Yeah, one last word about the Adams. The Adams was um, an alley jumper because the Adams, when it was built, the, the land was so expensive on Adams Avenue facing Grand Circus Park. So the entrance to the theater and the marquee was actually inside the Fine Arts Building. So you entered on Adams, and then you went under the alley, and the auditorium was built on Elizabeth Street. 
the next street over. Or if you wanted to go to the, the balcony, you went up the stairs and went over the alley to get into the balcony. So, not too many. The only other alley jumper I'm aware of was Milton Toronto. So, yeah, we got one more. They just made me remember that when I was a little girl, we'd go to the Masonic Temple and we'd see movies in one of the smaller uh, auditoriums. And I remember the big organ uh, they played at first before the movies, but that doesn't fit into this, right? Well, they may have in the Scottish Rite showed a film, which is the, it's about a 1600 seat theater. Yeah. Yeah, which is, uh, it's the Jack White Theater today. Thank you. Okay. Um, Can we this, I mean, actually, this gentleman with, with his hand up right there actually knows a little bit more about theater organs as well. So I don't, I don't know, Richard, if that's what you're going to be commenting on. Okay. Yeah, I belong, I belong to the Detroit Theater Organ Society, and uh, we uh, have been restoring um, the old theater pipe organs um, in the area. But today there are, let's see, we have the uh, original theater pipe organ out of the Fisher Theater, now uh, available. And the Redford uh, has a theater organ. There used to be one we kept up at the Punch and Judy in, uh, in Gross Point. And we also maintained the one in, um, at the Royal Oak Theater. The Royal Oak Theater uh, pipe organ is gone. Uh, and the, um, uh, the Fisher, the original, 1928 installation of the uh, of the Wurlitzer Theater Pipe Organ in the uh, in the Fox Theater is still uh, up and operating. So we have about four of the those wonderful instruments still up and running in the Detroit area. Which is what about the Senate? The Senate Theater. That's that's it. The Senate is uh, we have the. Uh, the original Fisher, Fisher that's where it is. installed yeah. in 19. A lot of these organs went in in 1928. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever happened to the organ out of the Washington building? Downtown or Royal Oak? Oh, the Washington um, Theater. That moved, and unfortunately, uh, that that moved out of the. Somebody bought it, and it moved, I think, to Wisconsin or someplace, and they. Uh, took it apart and sold it for parts, oh. various voices of the art and so forth and so on. Um, but there's another one in Royal Oak, um, a very small one, <clears throat> in that little theater, the Baldwin Theater has one. It's, it's a small one, but very nice. The Michigan and Ann Arbor still has its original part also. Okay. Um, I'm going to be around if you want, because they want to wrap it up, because the library closes soon. So, so uh, thank you for coming tonight, everybody. Thank you.